With over 30 years of precious heirlooms to choose from, we've a few old masters in the vaults. Time to dust down a few of them as we open the archives for Priceless Antiques Roadshow. We Brits love to explore and we don't like to return home empty-handed. We often see souvenirs of the days when British travellers, often aristocrats, toured the globe to amass the most remarkable treasures. Coming up, we illustrate how that instinct is alive and well on our team. Oh, that's marvellous. Now, that's a great treasure. That's, a, that's a, a pottery wig curler. And perhaps it was dropped from the palace at some stage or another by some rather grand gentleman. It's been lying there for 300 years. Also, general expert Clive Stuart Lockhart reveals the one object he would have done anything to record. In fact, it's probably one of the things on the roadshow that I'd love to have had as well, so not just recorded, it's one of the things I wanted to take home. And Michael Aspel picks his personal favourites from the roadshow archives. I was so lucky in that, that in my very first show, an object came up which meant something personally to me. This is Kenwood House in North London, handsome home to the first Earl of Ivy, who at the age of 25 began collecting what was to become one of the finest groups of 18th century paintings in England. He bought this house just to accommodate it. Collecting is a great British passion, and the Antiques Roadshow has always been a magnet for collectorholics. I think collecting is in the British genes, actually. I think we're all guilty. I think we've all got it inside us. We are all secret hoarders. I have to ask, yes? what's a nice boy like you doing like, collecting, collecting beads? He is a man who actually not only likes the test card, he adores them. What started this unhealthy interest? At the foundation of every wonderful collection is a personal passion for the subject. When I see collectors that are really living the dream and kind of dressing like their heroes, I think he's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. I can see you have a lot of fun in your household. Well, I think we do, yes. <laughs> now, the guy who collected the Disney uh, material was pretty much your typical Disney collector. So you're something of a Disney fan, I take it. I think I'm a Disney fan here. freak, you name it, yes. I saw these in a shop in Bath, both together. Had to have them. them. The um, figurines for toothbrush holders yes. uh, are all original purchases by my family. Tell me about this. I found this in the Chang Crossroad, and there's the magic signature. I'm afraid my wife is not called Eileen, but I think she'll have I think, to, I think she'll she'll have have to change be, her name. She'll have to nickname <laughs> yes. herself Eileen. I think so, also known as. <laughs> yeah. You can't believe this collector. He was completely passionate. I went to see Fantasia for about, oh, it must have been near the 30th time, and that gave me the cue to write to the Disneys and say how much I would loved the film. And they wrote back and said, well, we feel that some of you have seen Fantasia for 30 times. He ought to have the original program. How did you get all these signatures? Because well, these are signatures of the animators and, and so on. I went to Los Angeles and visited the Disney Studios and I simply asked them, please, could any animator artist who worked on Fantasia sign? Mm. He could do the Donald Duck voice and the Mickey voice and anything else in between. Sure, a small <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mickey. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I love talking to enthusiasts on the roadshow and I love the challenge to try and interpret their passion to a wider audience. My grandmother used to say, it's not the corf that carries you off, it's the corfin they carry you off in. And this is an extraordinary collection. A little bit different, yes. It's great. Now, I mean, I have to ask, do you have a professional interest in this? <laughs> yes, yes, you could possibly say, yes. I, I am a, a funeral director. You are. Yes, yes. When I asked the owner whether he had some kind of business connection with this, because he was dressed really quite soberly, I couldn't believe it when he actually said he was an undertaker. It was a, just a gift. 
let's just talk about what they were for. I mean, we've obviously got um, powder compacts here, this one and this one, dating from the 1930s probably. And then something which I think is just great, this one in the middle here that actually says, snuff it. So obviously a snuff box. It's, it's a collection to die for. <laughs> As long as you come to me, then. <laughs> Some collectors are truly devoted to their collections. This owner drove all the way from the Netherlands to get his cameras on camera. There are many times on the road show where I'm confronted by a collection that stops me in my tracks. This is one of them. I have never seen a collection of Nikons like this in one place at one time, and I suspect I'm very unlikely to ever see a collection like this again. The gentleman who owned the collection, of course, he is one of the leading authorities by the nature of what he does. To me, when I think of Nikon, I think of photojournalism, and we've got the F-series. Well, the F has become a legend. It came out in 1959 and has photographed every major incident around the world. It was there when Kennedy was shot. It was there when man walked on the moon. It's quite interesting filming a piece like that and having to be intelligent about it, knowing that you're actually talking to, again, someone who is really very good at their subject. Is this the whole collection or...? Oh, no. It's, it's, no. Uh, no, it, it's, it's about 5% of what I've got Five percent? But essentially, if I said there's 150,000 pounds worth on this table, I'd be being conservative, would I? Very, yeah. you get the half of it, probably. We don't know everything about everything. And when you see a collector, they have spent their life, maybe 20, maybe 30 years, on one subject. And what comes out of a conversation with a collector is the passion and enthusiasm for that one subject. So which of you two is the collector? It's me. They're my, they're my cigarette cars, they're my guinea golds. And I've been collecting those since I was about 15 or so. And I thought, gosh, you know, we, you know, we see a lot of people on the radio show, how am I gonna have time to look through all of these cards? But he'd made my life easy because he had only collected one firm. He'd only collected Ogden's cards. Why Ogden's? Because the cards are so fascinating. The subjects dealt with range from dogs, cars, footballers, cricketers, war generals from the Boer War, actresses, you name it, they had cameras, they took pictures of them. Yes, we've been as far as Preston for one card. Which one was that? Is that here? Oh gosh, this one. That is quite a rarity, I it believe, is. yes. And, and it was a set of 1 to 1148, and that was the last card I needed to complete the run-through. Gosh, and you found it. Yes, How do right. you feel? How did it make you oh, feel? Oh, it was it? wonderful. That was magic. <laughs> I love that. I love that precision about collecting. So much so that they were prepared to drive, you know, the breadth of the British Isles. It's fanatical. <laughs> That's what you are. It's, uh... Compulsive is probably not the right word. It gives you an, a, an aim in life. It gives you something to do, and it's, in, it's exciting sometimes. That card alone, if you went to sell that at auction, would probably reach about 1,000 to 1,200 pounds. So when one has to put a value on your collection, my goodness, I think you certainly would see it um, being valued at about 50,000 pounds. Crumbs. When I say crumbs in, in that programme, I meant it, because you don't think of your cards being of that value. You just think of the individual cards that you look at, enjoy, touch, sort out, etc. And you don't think of the whole picture. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. A new <laughs> God forbid if we had a fire, wifey's under instructions, we open the door, throw the cards out of the window and let the house burn. <laughs> Not surprisingly, many of our roadshow experts have themselves felt the collecting urge. Well, do you know, I think I was born a collector. I can trace my collecting back to the age of four when I acquired this jug. And I've been collecting ever since. I collected stamps. But my first real love was books, old books. And I bought my first old book when I was 12. And it was Aesop's Fables, 1708. And it cost me two old pence. <laughs> This is going way, way back. As a child, I collected badges. Not just one or two. I probably had about, uh, ooh, 
two or three hundred maybe badges. I was really interested in badges, so anywhere I went, I collected a badge and I mounted them on boards and um, they were in my bedroom <laughs> and I had all these different badges. I used to make labels for them underneath to remind myself where I'd got these badges from. And gosh, do you know, I've still got those badges now in the attic. Let's get them down. Well, that makes me feel a bit better about my childhood doll collection. Now, rarities always send a tremor through the hall at the Antiques Roadshow. The experts will huddle around an object that they think is particularly special. But generally, only one of them will get to record it. And of course, the experts who aren't there on that day will miss out completely. Clive Stewart Lockhart from the Collectibles team couldn't make it to our filming at Skegness in 1996, so he saw a very unusual bottle for the first time when he tuned in to watch the programme. David Batty and Paul Atterbury were very reluctant to let this little object out of their hands, and Clive could only watch as he realised that his dream object had got away. The items I would love to have recorded, in fact, it's probably one of the things on the roadshow that I'd love to have had as well, so not just recorded, it's one of the things I wanted to take home most, uh, was the William Burgess piece, which was recorded by Paul Asbury and David Batty in about 1996, I think it was. We have here what looks to me like a piece of oriental porcelain with a Western Victorian mount. Is, am I right? I think you're probably right. This lady had turned up at the show with this little object. She had no idea what it was. The Chinese pot is interesting. It is simply a vehicle for decoration. Yeah. Yeah. This is a piece by William Burgess. Now, do you know who William Burgess is? No, apart from his name on the... On the but pot. that doesn't mean anything to you? Not a lot, no. She had some clues, but she knew nothing about Burgess. She knew nothing about uh, who he was, where he came from, anything. Right, where do we begin? Um, <laughs> we could be here for hours. He's <laughs> one of the most important Victorian designers. Yes, of yes, architecture, yes. of yeah. metalwork. This Chinese pot, which was an 18th century Chinese pot, had been taken by Burgess and, and then adapted. We've got pearl, we've got moonstones. Burgess uh, was an extraordinary man. Everything he did was a sort of riot of decoration. Burgess's eccentric decorative ideas can be seen today in his designs for Cardiff Castle and Castel Koch. But of course, for a bottle like this, there is no precedent. He wasn't modelling it on anything. He was using purely his inventiveness. It's a fascinating object, but Clive has a more personal reason to covet the Burgess bottle. I was brought up a, a, abroad uh, in Africa and in Mauritius and came back to England for the first time to live in England in 1968. We lived just around the corner from a house called Tower House. And Tower House was this extraordinary little castle in Kensington built by William Burgess. And every time I walked past the house, almost every day, uh, I would look longingly at this funny little castle and wondering who lived there and what went on. He built a house for himself in London, Tower House in Melbury Road, which itself is the, ha is the house of dreams, an astonishing painted interior. And this particular piece, which he made for himself, comes out of that house. Furthermore, there is a set of photographs of his house taken in the 19th century by Francis Bedford. The album is in the V&A in London, and this bottle is illustrated in that book. Clive's teenage obsession with Tower House wasn't only about its Victorian owner. In fact, at the time, it was bought by Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. You know, so that, as a young man who was interested in Led Zeppelin, you know, that was interesting as well. So it had all sorts of resonance for me. And it was so weird for a, a boy who'd been brought up abroad to see this funny little Victorian Gothic castle. This was one of Burgess's own treasures. So this was something that was, you know, in the possession of the great man himself. And it was in that house at one time. It was a very tangible piece of history, that. Marvellous thing. We're getting to know our team of experts a little better in this programme, and some of the most familiar faces have the most surprising passions and pastimes. Take jewellery expert Geoffrey Munn. His day job is overseeing an exquisite collection of priceless gems, but when he's off duty, he goes in search of more modest treasure, and he's ideally located to find it. This is the most important view to me. I'm completely passionate about it. Gloria, Gloria. Gloria, Gloria. 
I walked in here and I thought, I have to live here. It was a complete love affair. It's incredibly urban. It's very sort of boogie-woogie in New York with the cars hurtling round, and, and yet it's absolutely sort of seething with history. History does eat me up. It's complete and utter passion. I think it's a challenge to try to evoke the ghosts of the past, to understand what it was like for our predecessors, their lives. Um, here I can hardly go outside the door without running into a ghost. The River Thames has become a magnet for Geoffrey. Here he can really explore his passion for the past. I love the Thames. It, it's like a vein to the heart of London, and it was critically important in the past um, as a means of communication. It was the road, and so the people travelled in silent boats in a rather silent world, a world without engines, really only horses and crying merchants and sails and oars. It would have been splendid. It's not life on the water that brings Geoffrey to the river, but the mud at its edges. I'm souvenir hunting, souvenirs from the past. You won't find too many tourists down here, but for me it's a fantastic spread of archaeology. It's called mudlarking, and you do need a license to do it, that's desperately important. But once you've got all that together, it is nothing more interesting, nothing more pulse-making. It's a muddy paradise, isn't it? And very good to have the varifocals because you have to have pretty, oops, you have to have pretty sharp vision. Uh, oh, that's marvelous. Now that's a great treasure. That's, that's a, a pottery wig curler and um, it dates from the 18th century and was used to curl formal horsehair wigs. And, um, and perhaps it was dropped from the palace at some stage or another by some rather grand gentleman, some sort of Gainsborough figure. But um, it's been lying there for 300 years. Mudlarking has very ancient roots. It was a way in which people could come down onto the river to find something of value and then sell it or use it to keep themselves alive. People actually used to pick through the sewers, never mind the river, for things of value. So it was abject poverty at that time. That is a horse's tooth. <laughs> it's obviously a, 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 a sad place for horses, but that's what it is. It's a very historic place. The Romans were here, the Vikings were here, the Tudors were here, and the tide gently washed the objects that they've thrown into the river backwards and forwards. And one day I'm gonna find a Viking axe head. I know it, I haven't yet, and I want to very much. Can you imagine a small boy aged over 50 finding a Viking war axe? That's the job. Put history back on these modest things and make something more of these shards, these little links with the past. I found fantastic things, wonderful, wonderful things. None of them are worth anything, but each one has a very, very special story to tell. And I'm very, very excited. It's brought out the small boy in me. I think it's the Wellingtons. I think a lot of people who see me on television talking about jewellery think that that's um, the pitch at which I'm interested in art, and it certainly isn't, actually. Um, I'm interested in the past, no matter how it expresses itself. And to me, the, the, the clay pipe is just a, as much a valid part of the past as, as, as a marvellous piece of court jewellery. these objects. They are silent witnesses. They, they will tell you a lot, but you have to encourage them with your knowledge. It doesn't have to be enormous by any means, but certainly your imagination, and it can be on a very intimate level. I really enjoyed myself no end, and I've got a little table of treasures here, each one reeking with history, and it's my job to find out a little bit more about them, really, and I think I will. Um, there's plenty of evidence to work on, and plenty of ghosts. Since we filmed with Geoffrey, he reported his finds to the Museum of London, as all mudlarkers must, and they've identified this as a shard of Chinese porcelain painted three or four centuries ago in China.
and this sailed the seven seas in a wooden cargo ship to London, and there it was almost certainly in use in the old Palace of Westminster. And when it got broken, it was ditched in the Thames as rubbish. Every day, two tyres have risen and fallen over it for centuries, and it remains perfectly clean and unspoiled by mud and water. We love finding buried treasure on the Antiques Roadshow, and one man saw his fair share during eight years at the helm of the programme. Michael Aspel takes a look back at his favourite roadshow moments. It's hard to believe that it was uh, eight years exactly that I did on the roadshow. Um, and I look back to the very first one that I did and I, I, I can't remember the terror that I felt when I started because, of, you know, as I've said many times, I didn't want to spoil a, a perfect programme. Barnstable is the oldest borough in England and in Saxon times was given the right to mint its own coins. If only old age brought everyone that privilege. I was so lucky in that, that in my very first show, an object came up which meant something personally to me. I bought it off a chap that was dealing in bric-a-brac in Newport Market in South Wales some um, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. What did you pay him? Um, oh, what is it, 70 or 80 pounds, and I think I gave him about a tenner to get it fixed, which was a lot that's, of money. That's and, a lot of money. Yeah. Well, as a watch, it's probably worth, in fact, more like a couple of thousand or so. Yeah. But this is a repair bill. Yeah. Yeah. 1933. Yeah made out to a T.E. Shaw of Clouds Hill, Morrison and Dorset. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Do you know who he is? No, I haven't got a clue. It's Lawrence of Arabia. The watch, the aviator's watch that had belonged to Lawrence of Arabia, Simon Bull, uh, was the expert who, who revealed it to the stunned owner who must have said, good God, 50 times during this. Good God. If I'm correct. Yeah. After the First World War, yeah. he was a somewhat of a complex character, mm. and he rejoined, I think, didn't he rejoin the RAF under the name of Shaw? Yeah. And I think he was killed under the name of Shaw on his motorcycle when dressed in RAF Good kit. God. To be honest, to be perfectly honest with you, I always thought he was a fictional character, um, a character of fiction, I did. No, 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 no. It's the, it's the T.E. Lawrence of, well, as Good you say, God. of the marvellous film, yeah, well, and he wrote the book. Not only was he a boyhood hero of mine, uh, Lawrence, not Simon Ball, um, but it was the, the dates on these things, they were, they were the year I was born. So, a yeah. um, couple of grand, couple of half grand, as just as a watch, yeah. how much you could add for the Lawrence connection, I don't know. He's one of the most fascinating characters of the early part of this century. Yeah. I would, it, it's a guess. I'd double that, maybe yeah. five, maybe ten. Good God. I'd better get it in short. I took it as a great omen, and so it was. I was so excited when the Ian Fleming books came in because I had read every one of them, and they were published when I was a young fellow. So they were uh, my my meat. That's, that's what I loved. I remember discussing them heatedly with friends as if they were you know, deep literature. It says, to Una, who worked like a slave, from Ian Fleming, 1957. Now, who is Una? That's me. That's you? Yes. And who worked like a slave for him? Well, I worked for him as his secretary, but he also, you know, it was agreed that I could type his books and personal things as well. So you had to do that on top? To see the hands of the lady who actually physically created these books, it was just wonderful. I wanted to go and embrace her and say thanks for many happy hours, but I think people would have misunderstood that. And here's another one on Dr. No by Ian Fleming, yes. again, uh, to Una with apologies for her sudden death. So what is that all about? Well, uh, right at the beginning, um, he did call the, the victim Mary Trudad. Right. Uh, uh, so it was named after me. Right. But to have a sudden death uh, yes. right at the beginning. Yes, shot at the beginning. She was shot at the beginning? Dear, oh, dear. Much. Well, tend signed Ian Fleming's. I reckon at something like £6,000 a copy. Thousand each. Yes. 
So many people at home watch every week and say, I had one of those and I threw it away, whatever. And I had all those Bond books as brand new, pristine things and we could never have dreamt that they were going to be treasures one day. If only I'd known. The palace, Hampton Court. The sheer scale and beauty of Palace Castle in mid Wales is quite operatic. Welcome to a very special edition of the Antiques Roadshow, Down Under. People are always asking what's the best place you went to on the roadshow, and it's impossible to say because everyone had its own merits. I fell in love with several places, but the one I remember most, I think, is Port Marion. It was just amazing. I had my best night's sleep on the whole of my time with the roadshow at Port Marion. I fell into a deep, dreamless, refreshing, renewing sleep. I remember it not only for, its, uh, for the look of the place, the magical look, uh, I remember opening the bedroom window and thinking, this is another world. And the window opened next to me and there's Lars Tharp saying, ooh, which spoiled it a bit. Prito Place, the house was lovely and the owner was charmingly eccentric. Someone in his family had had a piece of music that had been written by Ivan Avello. But this piece of music had never been played and they brought a piano out of the house and put it on the lawns and this piece of music was played for the first time ever on the road show. And I thought, I thought it was enchanting. At the end of a good day, it's that sense of achievement and a sense of pleasant tiredness and if the sun is going down in the right way, it's about as convivial and enjoyable as um, anything you can imagine. There you go, Ed. Michael Aspel confirming that some roadshow moments are truly unforgettable. That's about it for this episode. We'll be back with more revelations next time, including the most ancient objects the roadshow's ever seen. This is a souvenir of a very, very remote past and very exciting. We discovered the real reason for Henry Sandon's love affair with Worcester pottery. I was curator of Royal Worcester and the Parents Museum for 17 years. I've loved the Worcester factory most of my life. And we take a look at some of the spookiest items that have ever appeared on the show. It had this one black glass eye that wherever you were filming it from, you could feel this beady eye following you round. As we trawled through three decades' worth of archives, we spotted some rather striking style statements. Visitors to the show and specialists alike have cut quite a dash over the years. I'll leave you with a few unforgettable fashion moments. Bye-bye. They seek him here. They seek him there. His clothes are loud. But never square It will make or break him So he's got to buy the best Cos he's a dedicated follower of fashion He's a dedicated follower of fashion oh, it's <laughs> Shop Boys join Adrian and Christine on BBC One now for the 400th edition of The One Show. Here on BBC Two, a couple of teachers go back to the drawing board for their dream home in Escape to the Country. And on BBC Three, a chance to see the nail-biting 2007 Doctor Who Christmas special.